So we are meeting now in cluster four, which is dedicated to cross-cutting principles to address a transformative research and innovation agenda. And I think that it's it's that we have to set the context if we aim to develop a common European research framework dealing with different countries and cultures and languages and across a number of different disciplines, then there are several requirements that we must meet. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, our interdisciplinary research is ethical and transparent. And also we need to incorporate uh, the analysis of these cross-cutting principles. So to, to see if we are applying them into our research and innovation actions, including career choices, opportunities, and indeed how we develop and manage our research projects. So, okay, we, we are researchers. We know that we are probably very good at what we do. But I think that the main question here that we should address, and this is why we are meeting, is if we can make our research even better. So, before giving the word to the speakers, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Gemma Marfany. I'm a geneticist from the Universitat de Barcelona. I'm involved in work packages 10 and 11, work packages that are dedicated to dissemination and communication strategies in Torch. Um, there is also a reporter of the session, Dr. Ole Nijak. I hope I have said well the name. It, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. From Fortham. And uh, so, because this is also needed for transparency, we need to make an account of what we are talking and our conclusions. And so, I'm going now to introduce the first speaker. So, uh, Dr. Till Ansgar Baumauer, uh, he's an artist. He studied fine arts and has been working as a freelance artist, curator, and author. And he's interested in international collaborative art. He's working at the Dresden University of Fine Arts, and he is currently the project content manager and a speaker for EU for Art, which is an alliance of four European art universities. So I think this is also going to be very uh, illustrative uh, because many of us come from universities that are um, either more dedicated to science or to humanities. So to see the point of view of, of this alliance of art universities can be very, very uh, interesting for all of us. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, I will just share my screen with you. Is it okay? Can you see the screen and only the presentation, hopefully, not the rest around it? Uh, yes, we can see just only presentation. Oh, perfect. Okay. So, um, first of all, uh, Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and as you already mentioned in the uh, in the moderation, our approach in EU for Art and EU for Art differences is probably quite different from the approach of the other university uh, European University alliances. As we come, yeah, we, well, maybe let's call us simply the paradise bird somehow because we have a quite different approach to uh, the whole spectrum um, and I in, in fact I'm not the uh, content manager of the overall EU for Art Alliance I am uh, the project speaker and content manager of the SWOFs part of it which is EU for Art Differences so um, I just try to hop to the next image just to give you a short overview over the uh, overall project, but also over um, differences. EU for Arts uh, was funded from 2019 to 2022 um, with a lead in Budapest with our partners and uh, partners in Dresden, Riga, and Rome. Um, and it has a focus on fine arts, uh, especially in the Erasmus Plus context on, of course, uh, structuring a common curriculum and uh, focusing on methodological. Um, approaches to teaching, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the main project goes for the first and second cycle mostly. Um, while the EU of Art Differences project, which is, I would say, uh, the main common research project in the whole context, started on 1st of January of last year and runs until the end of 23, with a focus on artistic research, um, which 
includes also R and I third cycle models and um, outreach to society, open research, etc. Um, I'm I'm saying too much, etc. Obviously, um, but let's go maybe to the term of artistic research, and I must say that I was really thankful that Ludovic Tilly. Uh, also introduced it in his lecture this morning because it's uh yeah it's something relatively new it dates back to the 1980s the first approach towards uh understanding artistic practice as a process of um gaining insight and uh, creating knowledge which can bring uh, a dialogue or which can create a dialogue between sciences and humanities and the fine arts and which also goes towards society. And there have been, and there are still different schools and approaches to the, um, to the topic which have been developed during the last decades. And uh, this also goes to local and national third cycle models, which are quite different, which we experience even in our Alliance, where we have four academies at the moment uh, with, three no in indeed we have four different degrees so um we will not go right now for a joint degree in in our project but we try to find a, a meta level of exchange uh, for excellence and for the third cycle to bring partners together and to um combine the different viewpoints um what also is a tricky point is that there's a quite broad range of methodologies, which also uh, refers to the fact that artistic research is not only a topic for fine arts, it also goes for theater, for music, for dance, for film. And of course, each of these disciplines, of, for design as well, each of these disciplines have different approaches towards the questions how to uh, create intersections with sciences and humanities so that the yeah the bunch of methodologies is sometimes even unoverseeable <laughs> and this also goes to the um, nationally different approaches towards funding structures and acceptance as research because for example to stay with Dresden which is the leader for this um, project part we do not even have a PhD degree for fine arts at the moment here in Saxony um, so that we have to work with developing our tasks on very different levels. And um, I just included some images without further explaining them to give you an idea about how different outcomes of artistic research can be and how, um, yeah, what it might mean. So just ask me in case you are interested in, in certain points. And to give you an idea about our network, um, this is in the middle, there we are with eu for art uh, connected through black lines with the initial partners, mostly from the fine arts fields, museums, academies, um, foundations, and around the a newer structure, which also goes into sciences and humanities. But yeah, it's a very special network, let's say it like that. So um, just to hop to our R&I agenda and to give you a small idea about that, um, we have to say um, the scientific system or getting in touch with the scientific system for fine arts is really something very new. So um, we are in the process also through this project to develop certain tasks from the scratch which really go to uh, goes to many of the questions that you raised today um and therefore our uh, com common r and i agenda for the project right now relates mostly to what we have in common which is the idea of fostering and developing high quality artistic practice of course and uh creating third cycles or remodeling third cycles in connection with the concept of internationalization and mobility, as well inclusivity, and a strong focus on how to involve employees and staff into the process, which is also um, due to our experiences um, 
with the different partners, even more tricky than we um, expected. But which is also quite important for us is the third mission aspect because um, artistic research in general does not only have the intersections with sciences and humanities and social sciences, but it has a strong focus towards um, what can be done in society, with society and for society, so to say. Um, so just another example from art history with which many people, I suppose, would not call artistic research, but I think there's a high scientific aspect in it. So just I just wanted to uh, show it to you. And um, because you raised the question when you sent around the invitation, there would be certain points to, to discuss. Uh, so I just want to go for them. The gender uh, topic is, of course, relevant also in, in fine arts. No question. Um, we have equality plans for the partner institutions, and I can at least say for Dresden that the percentage of uh, female stuff is, at, um, I think, even higher than, than male stuff. Um, but there is obviously a gap um, between the sexes when you have a look at the difference between studies times and the postgraduate situation, which means, uh, for example, also the art market. We don't only have the focus on um, academic careers, mostly fine arts goes towards art market, etc. I hope I'm not talking too long. <laughs> so um, during studies, you have more than 60% of, of female students in Dresden. In the art market, it's about 30% in comparison to 70% 70, 70 of male um, artists which are successful. And um, also the, the unclear situation of um, um, academic career goes to a difficulty to have a clear idea about intersectional problems in terms of gender. So um, artistic research is a field of debate in general. And um, it's about the question to what extent artistic research is accepted in a broader context and is visible how to deal with the open methodologies um, and how which cannot be streamlined because they are too complex how to deal with quality assessment which um, it has to be individual processes mostly and um, how to deal with the local solutions and teaching methodologies, as well as the process focused out, um, approach of artistic research, which is not so much outcome oriented, but process reflective. I, this also indicates also that um, it's quite tricky to exploit the outcomes and that it's strongly related to society. And also we have difficulty in fact about the legibility and communicability of the artistic outcome, because it's always a blended thing between the process, the product maybe, and the, the textual, textual level. Um, so just to give you one more image, which is also quite, which has been quite famous during the last 15 years, I suppose. And, um, just the last point about interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. I think this is really the strength of artistic research because in, its, in itself as a fundament, there's already an interdisciplinary approach from a contextual sciences and humanities framework towards the artistic process. And it is to be found in PhDs, for example, in a co-supervision structure through scientists and artists, um, as well as an excellence assessment, which happens in, in the art field through different contexts, be it the academic or artistic research community, but also the art market and also the question of societal impact. Um, beyond that, um, there's a blend of more traditional hands-on skill-focused teaching methodology which is in tight contact with the digital transformation, which we also try to develop in our project with new teaching methodologies. That's quite exciting, I've, I think. And um, 
beyond that, just something I wanted to mention that especially in fine arts, we see that the uh, Western concept of aesthetics or the focus on our own cultural tradition, of course, um, inhibits a broader exchange, be it with the global South or in general with a transcultural approach to questions of insight and knowledge production. So this is also something we try to deal with. And yes, you can see for a quite small team, which we are, this is quite a, quite a big task. And that's maybe also a work situation, which can give you the idea that we are different <laughs> as the name says already. So thanks a lot. I will stop the screen sharing and get back to you. Well, thank you. I think it has been quite illustrative of what you're doing and also posing some of the questions that I think that later on we can just uh, just discuss um, among all of us. Um, if I had to choose a word, I think uh, it made me think is about this transdisciplinarity. I think that most of us that are scientists or doing humanities, we are doing interdisciplinary type of approaches. Transdisciplinary means above. So it's transcending things. And this probably uh, art is particularly well suited. So thank you. I'm, I'm moving to the second speaker, which is Professor Lorraine Lison. She is Associate Dean of Research at Trinity College Dublin. And, and Lorraine will draw on work from the Torture Package 3 that she coordinates to focus on cross-cutting principles and, and ask how we can uh, make it easier to do collaborative, equitable, ethical, multidisciplinary research in, in a European University Alliance, in this case in Torch, but also maybe um, that can be extrapolated to other uh, University Alliances. So please, Lorraine, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'll just add that I'm no longer Associate Dean of Research. I'm now Associate Vice Provost for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And so actually, the, I, f I find myself very interestingly positioned to think through some of the research uh, related questions and these questions around inclusivity in the broader sense. And you'll see that that's going to be a strand of thought in terms of some of the things that I said. But I'm delighted your, your presentation till was very much segues with the, the key themes that I want to address. But let's see now if the magic of the internet works and uh, if we can share some slides. Look at that, the magic works. Well, it is, I am here from the Torch Project and uh, I feel like I'm in outer space uh, with this lovely background that my colleagues have created. And while I'm talking about colleagues, I really want to say that the, the things that we're gonna to touch on here come from, um, the work that we've been doing on our work package on cross-cutting principles to address a transformative or an I agenda in the TORCH project. And I want to thank my TORCH colleagues and in particular Dr. Nina Scheel, who's here with us today, and Connor Spillan, our brilliant project manager. Um, now, in our project, as, as Gemma, <coughs> excuse me, has already said, um, oh, it's jumped. The, the key question I think that we need to ask is that, how do we make it easier to do research? How do we, you know, when we say we want to make it easier to do research, we mean bringing down barriers for participation, avoiding unnecessary reduplication of effort <clears throat> and simplifying institutional processes so that we can make it easier for all of our research and researchers. And to come back to the previous presenter's point, and also for researchers, regardless of the kind of research they're doing, I think we have to be inclusive in terms of understanding scholarship as an ecosystem. But how do we make it easier for everybody to engage in responsible research and innovation? For TORCH, we have um, seven stated specific objectives and the, the cross-cutting principles work package that we've been engaged on are implicated in two of them. And one of those is something we've heard a lot about earlier today, the, the goal of promoting social trust in universities through greater involvement of societal actors and citizens in research and innovation processes. 
but also through ensuring high standards of research integrity and scientific ethics. I think it was Juan who said earlier on today that you know we, we shouldn't pretend to be experts in things that we're not, because when we do that, we undermine our own scientific agenda. And I thought he spoke so eloquently on that point and others. Another one of our specific objectives is to develop a transformative agenda committed to the three cross-cutting principles that you see here of interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity, gendered innovation and ethics and integrity. I'm going to say a couple of things about those for a moment, if I may. Um, over the past few years, I've had the great privilege of working with brilliant colleagues in the Office of the Dean of Research at Trinity College Dublin and with colleagues from the Irish Universities Association and with Leroux through their Research Integrity Policy Group. And in all of those spheres, one of the common conversations was how research activity is increasingly professionalised and that this process brings with it additional obligations for research institutions and researchers and expectations that flow from this. And the cross-cutting principles that we see here are among the things that researchers now have to engage with, whether they want to or not. And of course, they provide challenges as well as opportunities, especially in the context of European alliances like ours. Because the transformational modules that we see over on the right hand side of the screen, they represent the essential aspects of the TORCH project vision concerning the future of research across our CHARM EU alliance. And the research that we intend to strive towards is going to have to be based on the common strengths of the alliance institutions. It's going to involve cooperation with non-academic stakeholders. It's going to involve open science practices and it will engage with citizen science and public engagement. And gendered innovation and research ethics and integrity, of course, are key principles of RRI. Interdisciplinarity informs the structures of government for our existing research and integrity and, and innovation practices. And in this way, it also operates as a critical third principle. So all of these things intersect and we all say that we want to do these things well because we're very ambitious, of course, but we need roadmaps and we are fortunate that there are other projects that we are building on. You know, we've seen all of the SWAFs gender related projects. Um, we know that we've, we've also talked about um, the, the Shape ID project is associated with our own Charm EU and Torch alliances. Um, but that said, we, we need to think about how are we going to stitch together all of the different approaches to doing these particular things? How do we make it happen? I mean, when, when you step back from it, in our own individual institutions, it can be really difficult to bring about processes of change. It takes time, right? We know it'll take probably a two year lead in if you want to get an online research ethics system up and running, or if you want to develop a new policy and bring it through all the relevant committees. So how do we then think about those things as they link into our own alliance work and what does that mean in practice? Well, of course, the research ethics and integrity to take a point is an essential element of the work that we're doing. Um, I won't go through all of these things, but I will say that some of the, the key challenges that we have identified for our alliance, and it may well be something that's shared for your own, is if we want to make it easier to do research together, we need to figure out how do we how do we stop having additional bureaucracy as we add additional institutions and streamline and harmonize our approach? Would having a singular uh, alliance level or RI handbook or a single research ethics process or an agreed upon mutual recognition process help us do these things easier? How do we ease the academic burden, the administrative burden? How do we speed up our responses? This goes back to our Hungarian colleague who spoke this morning about the, the, the rapid, um, the more rapid nature, the more rapid cycles of some kinds of research. And what would a seamless, singular, simple, but rigorous process look like in a multilingual, multicultural alliance anyway? I think we need to figure out what the end game looks like. Charm EU has the ambition to build uh, and to, to be built from the, the get go as an inclusive entity. But how does that play out in, in R and I processes? And what would success in those spheres look like? So there are some questions that we can still ask.
I mean, of course, you know, with the whole push towards gender equality, one of those other cross cutting principles, we can see that the key themes, things that we've all talked about this morning um, and that map to our cross cutting principles here on interdisciplinarity, gender dimension, open science, uh, and the question of engagement with citizens, civil society and end users are all features of inclusive practices in research. And we know also, of course, that the issue of gender equality uh, is key. However, on the issue of inclusiveness and how, you know, thinking about how inclusiveness then links in with interdisciplinarity, which links in also with ethical approaches to doing research, I think it's important to say that the very essence of interdisciplinary research is to bring together several lines of expertise to address a challenge. And in this case, we're thinking about how do we affect meaningful institutional change in the Charmy U member universities to enable research of the highest quality by excellent researchers, regardless of where those researchers come from or the focus of their research in question. So how do we then, I would suggest, take the well-established conversation on gender equality in the academic world and in different disciplines towards concrete actions? We also have to think about how gender equality work is part of that greater, broader umbrella of equality, diversity and inclusion work. And I'm delighted to have heard that mentioned several times this morning. But increasingly, our universities are bringing what were previously disparate responses. So we had gender over here. We might have had disability over here. We might have had racial and ethnic equality considerations in another separate space. But we're trying to bring those disparate responses under one heading and look at policy and practice driven responses. And that is going to be really important for us to think through in terms of where we want to go so that I think it would be a real lost opportunity if we said look we have to do these gender equality plans now let's just focus on those and leave all the other categories to later on and we have plugins we have an opportunity to be folding in consideration of where we want to be in 10 years time and doing that from now so that's that's another one of those things that I wanted to say the third of our key points is interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity, all these long inarity words that we keep throwing around. With our torch partner institutions, we agree on the importance of this kind of work, particularly in the context of addressing global and complex problems. But we need to consider how do we develop a process that allows this kind of work to flourish? How do we champion interdisciplinarity? We know that the European research agenda is increasingly focused on grand societal challenges. That's great. But yet, as we've heard this morning already, most of our universities are still structured around monodisciplinary lines and research management, including processes towards research ethics, uh, tend to follow those lines. So we need to think about the cultural shifts that we need to put in place to support that, but that's going to take time. At the same time, I was really interested to, to listen to a video recording of Professor Jeffrey Kosick from the Shape Idea Alliance. And he said, and I quote him, that he's wary of new structures, noting the risk that institutionalized units that seek to promote interdisciplinary work often get frozen in the grouping of disciplines that were fashionable when they were set up. So we don't want to do that, right? We want to figure out ways of being lithe and responsive. So how will we do that and be inclusive and think through, you know, you know, how do we do this in, an, in, in, in a multilingual or interlingual, multicultural, internationalized setting? Just a little thing for us to sort out in the next 18 months then. So the challenges and opportunities then. As our consortium have, have seen from our consideration of cross-cutting challenges, we're thinking about what would a good research practice policy look like at consortium level for a, a, you know, a, a, an alliance that may or may not become an independent legal entity at some point. Should we have consortium-wide gender equality plans? Do we need alliance-wide research ethics committees to separate out and increase the rapidity of response uh, to help our research happen faster. What about fostering interdisciplinarity? 
how do we provide for serendipitous interactions that underpin the exciting interdisciplinary work that we're engaged in? And how do we go beyond gender equality and seek to foster intersectional equality in all we do? So these principles have to be folded into all of our policies and practices as we develop. And because we're talking about alliances, I had to sort of look at an intergalactic alliance and say, we can certainly boldly go where none have gone before if we do it together. So I shall stop there and say thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. I think that also uh, you have um, made a presentation with lots of questions and it's open then to discussion. Uh, some of them are actually uh, similar to those posed by the first speaker. So that means that it, this is going to be a very lively discussion afterwards. So then um, I'm going to introduce um, two speakers that are from the same alliance, in the Euphoring Alliance. First, I'm going to introduce Dr. Mireille Estins, which is there. I hope that I pronounce well your name. Um, she's assistant professor in food innovation and health at Maastricht University. And she is the coordinator of the work package two of, of this alliance, Euphoring, uh, which is a work package dedicated to develop a wide community um, of, of so a community engaged research and innovation and establish, let's say, a scalable, effective, and impactful model of European universities. So that probably can be also extrapolated to other alliances. And together with her. It's going to, talk to uh, Dr. Nuria Bautista. She is also here. She's a researcher in the fields of information science, open science, and biometrics at the Universidad Carlos III in Madrid. And she's providing um, the research and development technical support at Euphrain Alliance. And so I think that uh, the two of them, probably maybe one or the other of the two, will see how they manage. We'll talk about uh, why open science is, is to be the new normal at institutions and how to make this research that is really um, engaging community. And, and so that uh, the way to promote our knowledge um, and to create it, maybe as a co-creation with society, can really uh, be one of the aims of, of, of the future university in Europe. So I'm going now to give you the floor to you two. So please um, go ahead. Thank you very much for this introduction. And also thank you uh, very much also for this opportunity and invitation, invitation uh, to give a presentation here and, and a discussion about this, uh, this topic. Uh, and it was also very interesting to see the presentations from the previous speakers, because I, I do believe that there are a lot of links uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards, but not uh, before I start sharing the presentation uh, and uh, give a short presentation about indeed um, the UFA model towards community engaged based research and innovation. Um, I hope you can see my screen. I do not see you anymore. So um, if not, then please. Yes, we can. We can. We can follow you perfectly okay. well. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, in this presentation, I will give you an overview about uh, the UFA model towards community engaged based research and innovation. Uh, and uh, in this uh, presentation, I will first introduce to you what is UFA, uh, what is UFARING, uh, what kind of approach are we taking in UFARING, uh, what is the definition of community engaged research and innovation, what are the characteristics. Uh, we identified already a couple of best practices, some success factors, and I will end with some challenges and in conclusion and future perspectives. But first, what is UFI? UFI stands for Young Universities for the Future of Europe, and the dream uh, and vision of UFI is uh, to create a leading model of a student-centered, open and inclusive uh, European university. Um, it should be an individualized and flexible lifelong learning and career pathway for both students, staff and citizens. It is based on a, a truly innovative research and work-based ecosystem uh, and uh, civic engagement and social, social responsibility are core values within the UFA vision and mission. Um, and the aim is to create the blueprint of, a, of Europe thriving on diversity, inclusion, collaboration, synergies and empathy. 
Uh, in UFA, uh, 10 universities are included for non-academic organizations, uh, and they are all located uh, in different countries and cities around Europe. In this slide, you can see an overview of the academic partners uh, of UFA, and uh, I'm from Maastricht University, uh, and uh, Nuria is from uh, University College Street in Madrid, um, as I already been introduced. Um, UFA is actually a top scoring alliance, uh, and it's a, it's a bottom up creation, uh, and there has been a three year uh, pilot phase until uh, November of last year. Uh, it's not a project, but a transformative uh, initiative. And within UFA, uh, there are actually different uh, UFA projects, uh, starting with the Erasmus Plus project, which shows us a UFA model for European University, and which is mainly focused on students. Uh, then we have DIOSI, which is a hands-on training for open science and open innovation for uh, early career researchers. Uh, uh, this third project is, is UFRING, and I will uh, give more detail about this uh, work package too from this UFRING project in this presentation, uh, but it's uh, focused on a uh, transforming research and innovation to a European-wide knowledge transfer. And last but not least, we have Inner for UFA, uh, which is focused towards a pioneering European university that powers a new generation of students, entrepreneurs, and uh, innovators. But like I said, in this presentation, I will mainly focus on the, on the third project, which is UFRING. Um, in UFRING, uh, the aim or the objectives are uh, to uh, create a community-engaged research and innovation agenda for an excellent and inclusive European university. It's a catalyst for flipped knowledge transfer and deployment in society, uh, and it's focused on recognition and reward and circulation of talents and teams across Europe, uh, and which is much appreciated is the UFA Open Science Strategy. Um, within UFRING, uh, yeah, these uh, different uh, objectives are focused uh, to actually create some shared research support structures to broaden impact for uh, the research and innovation community and society uh, and to have a system level impact so to create some joint structures and shared best practices uh, among uh, different European uh, universities. So the aim of UFRING is indeed to develop and establish a UFA-wide community-engaged-based research and innovation approach that is scalable, effective, and impactful, and can serve as an example uh, for other European university alliances. Within UFRING, we have uh, different subtasks, um, and I actually summed them up on this slide. So the first uh, subtask is to map uh, best practices in community-engaged research and innovation. The second one is to um, analyze existing research and innovation policies, support, and decision-making processes. The third subtask is actually to pilot this in a UV-wide community-engaged-based research and innovation model. In the fourth uh, subtask, we aim to develop some training programs, uh, while going on to the fifth subtask is to actually foster science outreach uh, and last but not least, it's uh, to develop a joint strategy towards a common UFA research and infrastructure agenda. And as you can see in each of these uh, subtasks, actually these different uh, uh, universities that are included in uh, UFA um, are actually responsible for these uh, different subtasks. But within this presentation, I will mainly focus on the, on the first subtask, uh, and show you some best practices in community-engaged research and innovation. Why is it important to look at uh, community-engaged-based research and innovation? We did a short uh, survey about this, uh, and uh, the result of this survey, or the preliminary results of this survey, actually show that approximately 50% uh, of the researchers thinks um, about uh, community-engaged research and innovation or engagement with external communities uh, when thinking about a new job. Uh, and if um, we ask the question whether it's important to researchers to actually be involved in community-based research and innovation, actually even about 60% um, of the researchers mentioned that it's very important to them to be involved in community-based research. Um, in the survey, uh, 573 uh, people actually uh, participated, uh, of which 50% are PhDs and 78% are academics. 
um, and 67% uh, actually is, th thinks it's important to be involved in uh, community and based research and innovation, of which 35% is actually, 45% of this uh, 573 uh, responders um, thinks it's, it's very, are actually involved in community and based research and innovation. Um, and 64% uh, of these 45% were specifically engaged uh, and actually spent about 15 days a year on community engaged research and innovation. So this actually strikes uh, why it's important uh, to have a look at the community engaged uh, research and innovation or CIRI. Uh, in the sub first subtask from Hufering, um, we uh, actually aim to map and define uh, community engaged based research and innovation and uh, fostered a multi thematic approach. Uh, and the approach is uh, first to define it, then map best practices of community engaged research and innovation. Uh, and last but not least, identify success factors, challenges and uh, tools within these, uh, these best practices. So to give you a summary about the uh, results we already have within this uh, first subtask is uh, starting with the definition of community engaged research and innovation. We define it as a participatory form of research uh, that is performed with, by, and for the community, uh, and that benefits uh, communities involved in direct uh, intervention and translating uh, research findings. Uh, it's very important that academic and non-academic actors work collaboratively, uh, and um, there are principles of reciprocity, uh, including uh, shared ownership of research. If we then look into the characteristics of community engaged research and innovation, um, we could summarize that uh, it, one of the most important characteristics is that it needs some social impact. It actively involves community partners in one or more phases of research. So uh, first in the execution of research, but also in the analysis of data uh, and um, implementation of research outcomes and innovative solutions. Uh, are uh, very important. Um, and one of the striking uh, characteristics is that there is a bidirectional relationship uh, so that there is uh, communication between both academic and non-academic uh, actors within community engaged research and innovation. We summarized a lot of bad pra best practices, uh, but on this slide, I give you just two examples. So uh, one example is from the University of Finland, where you have the All Youth pro Project, uh, and that is uh, aim to actually create possibilities uh, and enable young people to participate in their own communities and make society a better place. Well, for the University of Essex, um, there is a project actually where uh, veterans with uh, PTSD go on fishing trips uh, to improve uh, mental health. Success factors for Siri are um, diversity and contextuality. Uh, that the research process needs to be co-designed so that there is knowledge sharing and co-production, uh, that there is continuity, structure and a, a cyclical approach and impact, uh, and that there are multiplying effects of working together in a trusting relationship. And last but not least, uh, learning, growing and changing together um, yeah, is done by introducing innovative services and uh, programs. Uh, and last but not least, I will enter some challenges. So the main challenges which we have identified for community engaged research and innovation are focused on logistics. Uh, so to have enough time and funding uh, for uh, yeah, doing community engaged research and innovations. There are uh, focus on partners and collaborators. Uh, so to find um, the appropriate um, actors, uh, the, both non-academic and academic, uh, to be involved in community engaged research and innovation. And last but not least, there are also some challenges that are uh, principle uh, related. Uh, so with this, I actually would like uh, to uh, come to my conclusion. Uh, so we uh, already uh, made a definition uh, and uh, identified some best practices and success factors for community engaged research and innovation. And the future perspectives are uh, to um, actually map existing research and innovation policies, support and decision making uh, processes uh, to uh, make use of these best practices and include them in a piloting model, uh, develop some training programs 
uh, and fostered some youth uh, science outreach and taken all of this together, um, we would like to um, yeah, develop a joint strategy, taking all of these things into account uh, that can serve uh, as an example uh, also for other uh, European alliances. And with this, I would like to end my presentation uh, and um, yeah, hope then uh, yeah, the, the yeah, the, uh, present, yeah, there will be some time for discussion afterwards, but if in case you would like to have more information about UFE, about UFORING or, or Alliance, uh, feel free uh, to look up and, and check this, uh, this uh, website uh, to email us or to get in touch with us via other uh, social media channels. So thank you very much uh, for uh, yeah, this time and I hope uh, we can now uh, go on for the discussion. Well, thank you uh, for this uh, introduction to, to actually, as you say, it's, it's not really a project, but it's, it's something that it's a crescent a project because it's more a name, a goal. Um, then um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Bautista wishes to add anything or you are going to be uh, introducing subjects uh, of discussion now. Just I just to complement what Mirel has mentioned, I would also like to remark that the idea of this project is to try to implement this area approach at the universities. So it's just to try to do a transformative change at the universities and, for example, that, that, that there would be different units at the universities that acts as a, as a bridge between the different stakeholders. And also, I think one of the main novelties of this project is the open open science approach that maybe we could talk about this on the on the discussion later on. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, then uh, now the field is open for discussion and indeed I have uh, many questions, but I'm sure that some people in the audience probably also uh, want to to ask any questions. So before maybe giving um, us to the people that are in the audience. I don't know if any of you wishes to make any comment or any question to any of your other colleagues. Um, what do you think? Do you wish to to ask anything or do we go directly on to the questions of the audience? Sure, if, if I can. Uh, you know, I, I love this work and my, my own work is deeply committed to engaged research. I'm a big fan of open science and the open science agenda as a mechanism for moving us towards better social justice in the world. But my question is, is it right and fair that we expect everybody to do all of these things? That is a very good question because it also goes quite aligned with, with mine. But please go ahead if you wish, either Nuria or Mirei uh, to comment on that. Maybe I can make a start, Nuria, or would you like to go uh, first? You can start, Mirel. Okay. Yes, I, I, I do agree uh, um, with you, Lorraine, that it, this is indeed a, a very good point uh, to bring up, but I, I, I do believe uh, that it's also um, good to tackle some societal challenges and therefore we need some input from the society, from some uh, non-academic actors. Uh, and I think which is also very important and which are also some of uh, the main characteristics of uh, community engaged research and innovation, at least how we identify this, um, is that uh, there should then also be some shared ownership in the end and some bidirectional relationships so that uh, also like a non-academic partner is involved in, in the ownership of the, of, the, of the research in the end. I'm not sure whether you have some additions, uh, Nuria. I see that she... I don't see her anymore, but uh... maybe I, I think that she has some problems, maybe of connectivity. Mm -hmm. I think because there is a strange signal. Maybe then we can go because I think that uh, T. Well, I don't know how you wish me to call you T. Lanzar or Doctor. You can just call me Till. Okay, please Till, go me ahead me. because you raised your hand. Yes, I, I just wanted to say. Um, for fine arts, of course, it is not replacing artistic practice in general by uh, research related, society related strategies right now. It's uh, for us, it's just opening new doors towards discourse um, beyond the ivory tower. And I think that's quite similar to what the sciences and humanities do as well when they 
discuss about that. So it's more enriching the the palette of what we can do than forcing everybody to be right now very societal task focused or something like that, right? Yes. Um, well, if I, if I may add uh, also some nuances to what uh, you have already said, I think that the approach is very interesting, but cannot be the main or the unique, the unique drive for university, because the universities uh, wish to create knowledge, sometimes just out of curiosity. And sometimes society does not approve of knowledge by knowledge, just because uh, indeed they have other problems and, it, and they, they wish to find a solution for their problems and not just to pursue any dream. So I think that a combination of, of the two type of focuses, maybe it's also enriching Europe as a whole. So if Europe would be only community engaged research doing only this, probably we will fall behind because there are many things that could not be covered. So in a way, uh, what do you think? How do you envision? So because you say that this is a model um, that could be scalable and, and could be also extrapolated. How do you envision and how to match everything together? Um, I don't know if it Mire or Nuria or anyone has a comment. Um, I don't mind. Yeah, till first. Go first. Just, just a very spontaneous reaction because I just uh, experienced that working in the European Universities Alliances and being in exchange with the other alliances, there are already things happening. So we are just already in discussion and exchange. And I think that's the best point to, to find where the intersections can be and what we can develop together. And that will bring us all beyond the limits that we all had up to up to now maybe so uh, maybe we cannot really pin how the developments will be but there will be developments coming out of the whole process right now yeah well thank you i don't know if anyone else wishes to add any any other comment on this on this point because in a way what i think that probably um, one of the main conclusions of, of the alliances, and which is quite aligned on what Yufi is, is proposing, is that we must be aware that uh, we form part of, of a community, of our society, and that we should always be in mind um, that we need to be transparent on what we are doing. And if we are a public university with the money of every taxpayer, that means that we have to return our knowledge somehow, some way. And this probably could apply to everyone. It doesn't matter what you are doing your research. You can always be in mind that you have to be open, transparent, and, and tell people what you're doing and, and disseminate what you are doing. I think that Lorraine and also Mireille, I don't know, maybe first Lorraine and then Mireille can ask uh, to all of sure. these. Shapes. Sure, I, I just wanted to come back to clarify that I am completely on board with the idea of co-constructed research. I That is something I've dedicated my own research work to, so I believe in this. My question was more about how funding bodies now tend to expect every researcher to do everything and to do everything really well. They expect every researcher to be engaging in open science practices, to be um, engaged with society, to be communicating to a range of publics, so to be science communicators as well as excellent researchers, and to do everything within a really tight turnaround time. And I, I think, you know, from the conversation, it seems to me that team approaches help, you know, that we can, as alliances say, let's split the burden of effort across different parts of our teams. Uh, and that's part of the added value of an interdisciplinary approach too, rather than placing the burden for doing everything on the shoulders of one, each and every individual researcher. So it's about, I suppose it's about saying we're better together and we're stronger together in many of these things. 
Thanks, Lorraine, for this insight. And now Mireille probably wishes to uh, comment. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, what well, the point I would like to bring up, which I think also relates a lot to this, is also the uh, different disciplines. So I, I do uh, believe that there, for every discipline, there's probably uh, a societal challenge in the end uh, to be solved. Uh, but uh, to what extent and how this could be addressed could actually vary a lot uh, between different disciplines. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think there should also be uh, room uh, for all the disciplines uh, to be involved on, in, uh, for example, for community engaged research and innovation. So for one discipline, it's much more easy uh, to involve, for example, societal partners uh, in the execution of research, uh, while for another discipline, uh, it's uh, better to involve research uh, non-academic actors more in the uh, in, in the implementation of, uh, of certain research aspects. So I think uh, there could be um, yeah, different, um, if you look to the different disciplines, uh, how uh, non-academic actors are involved in the different phases of research that could may differ also between the different diff disciplines. And I think there should also be room and the possibility uh, to do that. And, and that's what we are uh, currently also having a lot of discussions about in, in our um, um, yeah, and our, our project is, is how to actually include this and how to standardize this then in the end. Thank you. I think uh, Lorraine has uh, said something that is very, uh, something is, is, is food for thought, uh, which is in most of, of researches at universities, they have to be very good at everything they do. So they have to be excellent in everything. And probably this is not the way we should go because this is uh, too much of a stress in the sense that we cannot be good at everything we have to do. And, and what you said about uh, being part of a team and in the, in the right sense of the world, of the world, so that everyone is sharing part of the, of the aims and is sharing also responsibilities and duties. But uh, I think this is one of the very interesting things and maybe we can come back to that uh, later on, when we talk about gender inclusivity and gender gap, which I think this is something that we also have on top of the table. And um, okay, I don't know any other uh, comments. Maybe we can move on to other topics. Oh yes, Nuria, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Gemma. And also, and sorry because I I lost the the connection, so I was like five minutes. I couldn't hear what you discussed, but also and what another aspect that is really important somehow is that the universities, these practices are uh, somehow valued. And I think, for example, in the in the current evaluation systems, for example, having, uh, I don't know, having interactions, having cooperation with different stakeholders are not really valued. And I think somehow in the Euphorium project, this is something that we also are trying to to also to put the emphasis on try to change the, the evaluation systems and the indicators that they are using the universities, for example, to be more broad, to be more to have more a broad perspective and including other aspects more related with open science, like citizen science, uh, I don't know, so many others that also tries to foster the, the collaboration between the different actors. Um, thank you. This is also good for thought. For many universities, I think there was a, this morning they were talking about how to to assess research and also uh, researchers. And I think this is a very valid point that we have to be more open and not just only judging uh, or evaluating CVs just only by the weight of the papers or the weight of the money they can get on funding and maybe just to be open to to other type of considerations that are also very relevant. And, and, and also, I think this is something that needs a standardization too, because otherwise it could be open to any type of, let's say, activity, which sometimes maybe it's not interesting for anyone either. So I, I, I admit that this is a very, very interesting point. Uh, and in, in the university, European university in the future, this is going to be a very hot topic. Thank you. Um, okay, maybe then we can move on to the gender gap and gender inclusivity. I think Till uh, just mentioned it as, as a very good point to, to talk in the discussion. Maybe you should uh, 
come again and, and say what you think about this and how we should address this gender gap? It's a, it's a tricky point, in fact, because um, as as I already mentioned, the the system of success of, of job profile development for artists is not taking place only in academy, but mostly beyond academy in the fine arts fields. And this is something which goes really out of our control. So um, we well, we can see that it's still a very masculine system, the art market. We can see that it also, well, if we would start to discuss quality assessment in terms of art market, then I think it would just, uh, the discussion would explode because it, there are lots of um, of points which cannot be easily explained through racial rational um, arguments. <laughs> so uh, we try to deal with all that together. And um, what definitely happens is that uh, support structures for female uh, staff members become stronger, that we have a strong focus in the academies, at least in the member academies, that at least 50% of the staff are female, that we are open towards um, further gender discussions, be it LGBTQ or whatever. Um, but we, of course, also we have to mention that not in every partner country, um, the legal framework is as liberal as we would like it to be. So, um, this is in some ways also beyond our control. Well, what we can do is to um, support within the, uh, the university, but also beyond through scholarships, grants, et cetera, what happens uh, in some ways on the art market and to explore the research field, the artistic research field as a new protagonist in the whole discourse. That's, I think, the main topic, just to uh, establish new fields that can be perceived for our practice and relevance, maybe. Thank you. Maybe Lorraine, as Vice Provost, uh, <laughs> you have something Gosh, to well, say to that. Oh, I have too many things to say. I thought that was very interesting, Till. I've been sort of reflecting on what you were saying there. I, I think what we monitor, we can measure. And I think we need to measure change over time. We need to know where we're going. We need to know where do we want to be in five, ten years time. Uh, I was recently talking to a colleague who'd worked in a UK university where they had had um, gold Athena Swan recognition. You know, that's the gender equality badge in the UK and in Ireland. And she said it took 20 years to change the culture within the institution to get to where they want to be. So we have to understand that this is a long term agenda item and we have to also I think learn from you know what is it that we're doing well around gender equality and what countries are doing things well how does that how can we translate that to other contexts by at the same time being mindful of differing cultural norms different societal expectations but then how do we help each other move in the direction of travel that we want to go in what is that? Do, do we have a common view on that? And can we move also from the gender equality achievements to other areas, you know, that intersectional approach? Because I think we, we have to not reinvent the wheel for each equality ground that we come across. We have to see how we can mutually reinforce positive developments. But I really believe we need to have action plans and we need to monitor and we need to measure and we need to not be afraid to have difficult conversations. You know, I think we have to be really willing to say, look, this is a tricky one, but what are we going to do about it? And how can we incrementally move towards change? I love the Japanese talk about the art of Kaizen. They say, you know, little, little changes over time cumulatively brings about significant impact. And I think that's also what we want to achieve. It doesn't have to be a magic wand moment where everything shifts. Um, so, you know, they, they would be the, the things that I would be thinking on that point. Can't hear you, Gemma. 
Ah, I was muted. Sorry. Uh, yes, I was. Uh, I was just uh, saying thank you to you, and then uh, just giving the word to Euphring. And how do you uh, how they uh, envision this, and how they deal with this uh, gender gap? If they really are aware of that, I suppose yes, because it happens everywhere. But um, how, I think it's a very difficult. Uh, and later on, maybe I will say something about this. But please go ahead. Um, yes, of course, uh, uh, we are also uh, looking to the uh, gender equality in the, in the Euphoring. Um, and what we're trying to do is then indeed uh, to make sure that in interviews, but also in the uh, community engaged research and innovation, that there is a balance between uh, men and women. Uh, um, and yeah, it, we have uh, equality regarding uh, gender. Uh, and uh, ways to actually uh, accommodate this is actually what we're trying to do is uh, to bring people together to discuss um, potential barriers uh, and actually also um, yeah to make uh, yeah sure that um, yeah uh, that particular uh, barriers or, or things are discussed and, and and have a look how we can uh, um, yeah, ensure that uh, that there is an equality between uh, uh, yeah, uh, man and female, uh, also within the youth ring. Yeah, well, my my experience as an evaluator, I am a geneticist. I already told you, so this is quite hard science. Uh, my experience is that okay, we have improved the numbers of students. Female students are now a uh, majority. But then when uh, you come after PhD and, and, and really uh, women that can get a fixed position, then it drops steadily and, and really we have not improved. So what we have done is that the numbers of students and then the numbers of, of females or let's say whatever, because I want to be inclusive, but that is not strictly male, let's say, go ahead until they bought a PhD but then it drops and we have not improved the numbers because we have empowered uh, these uh, more vulnerable communities. But at the same time, we say, OK, uh, you now have um, the right conditions to, do, uh, to, to compete. And then the competition is not fair because what you are going to measure and evaluate at the end has uh, it's easier for kind of masculine view of the world, which is much more competitive. And that's a problem. I, say, I, I always say, if we say that we are very objective in the way we are evaluating, and we say we are going to promote, to give a new position to that person who runs the fastest and is the tallest, this is very objective. But most of the times it's going to be a male. But it's objective. You know, the way the criteria we are using, it's biased, it's biased. And that's what we have to change. We have to change not only the opportunities, maybe opportunities are now, we can improve there, but it's not only a question of more STEAM girls. No, it's not a question of having more engineer girls studying. It's not a question because then they drop, they drop out of the system. So the thing is, we have to improve. It is a bottleneck. So you put more women, but then at the end, to still drop out, and only very few of them end up having a fixed position or whatever they want to go, even if it's an artist. So we have to change the criteria we are using and the view. And this is, as Lorenz says, is is really little by little. This you cannot change uh, one night to, to the next morning. That's my first reflection, and second reflection. On, on at least on the scientists, but I think this could apply to all fields. I think that women have successful or more successful women have to mentor young women or mentor uh, more vulnerable people because you can tell them in advance what are uh, the barriers, what they can expect, and how can they circumvent them somehow. And I think mentoring is very relevant in academy, extremely relevant. And women that have some success have, I would say, uh, they have the duty in a way to, to tell 
younger, younger uh, mentees how to survive in a way. That, that's, that's my, my advice. And, and co-mentoring means that if you have to apply for funding or you have, okay, you have one who is more senior at the same level than one junior so that you are helping to step uh, more easily. I, 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 that's, that's my advice, but I don't know if this could be extrapolated to all fields and all universities. I don't know if you have anything to say or comment on that. I'm, I'm, I've stuck my hand up there. I don't want to be hogging the conversation. But I think, again, you're know, thinking about us working in university alliances. I know that in many of our individual universities, we have mentoring programs in place. But what would it look like if we were to transpose that to interinstitutional or pan alliance processes? So if we were to have gender equality plans at alliance levels, how would they look different from individual university gender equality plans? And are there, like, what would the added value be? So would there be value in having some of those um, more internationalized perspectives, perhaps, on mentoring? Um, you know, what, how, how would we, how would we, you know, have the opportunity to learn from some of the really great practices that are happening in some universities around putting in place, say, domestic violence leave policies or dignity and respect policies that we could then leverage and work on building in our own universities. So how would how would we continue to have that two way conversation between alliance and individual members that's going to enrich us <clears throat> as a result of the work that we do. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. This may be what we should strive because indeed, as you say, probably in the personal or individual level, some of us are also doing this, but maybe this should be something a bit more on the institution, but also, as you say, more uh, across countries, across disciplines, across different type of cultures, which I think would be very enriching for the Europe we all want to be in. Yes, I agree completely with you. We should be widen the horizons probably on this. Thank you. Um, maybe now we can um, move on to, on to research uh, integrity and, and, and ethics. Um, I don't know who of you wishes to to make any any how how you would say that this is going to shape um, our our alliances and and our let's how do we envision for Europe to integrate uh, research integrity and and research ethics in our daily life? Any of you? Till, you wish to say something? What about integrity in arts, in fine arts? Yeah, that's a that's a tricky question. I just wondered if it goes together with the freedom of artistic expression, because um, this is indeed a relevant point which we can see uh, pops up in several countries at several times, but it's always in discussion. So there's there's on one side the question, are you limited in your expression through political or ideological systems? That's, of course, what we have to uh, oppose against. On the other side, of course, there's al also the question, um, do you use that label of artistic freedom to, um, to allow any behavior, even which goes beyond the let's call it normal uh, ways of in social uh, interaction. So this is, this is quite a tricky thing. I think for the, for the research part of artistic research, it's quite easy to answer that, of course, we try to follow uh, the rules and uh, to 
to focus on um, data protection, etc. Th those hard hard fact uh, approaches, but in in the other way, it's something which is in the middle of discussion, I suppose, and which can only be debated um, example by example in some ways. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, in your field, as you say, uh, this is a very tricky type of, and it's a food for thought, uh, whether you are, right, it's a compressing people, uh, pressing so that they cannot really express themselves. Maybe in what country it's allowed, but in the next one, it's forbidden. Yes, uh, this is food for thought. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you wish to say something, Mireille or Nuria, about ethics integrity? Because I think in your uh, presentation, that was a very relevant point, too. Would you like to go first, Nuria, or shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Mireille. Okay. Yeah, so regarding research integrity, I think, um, I think open science aligns a lot with the uh, yeah, with community engaged research and innovation, I think uh, to uh, yeah publish in, in open access journals to make research available for the uh, for the public. I think that's um, yeah one of the points that aligns a lot with uh, research. Uh, yeah, with community engaged research and, and innovation. Uh, another thing I would like to address related to this is. Um, yeah, if you think about community engaged research and innovation and not only about communicating results, but also um, how to involve uh, non academic actors in the process of, of research itself, uh, then that's uh, also a, a point which we should take into account, like how to perform good research and, and um, yeah, how to standardize this also for people that are not uh, having an um, uh, yeah, did a study on how to perform good research and so on and how to standardize and make sure that this is good research. So this is something I think this is a point and some food for thought maybe to be addressed in the community engaged research and innovation. Yeah, thank you. You're right. I mean, they, this is also this is something that is really very relevant and is that um, you can only label research of good quality, if at least it's, it's, there is integrity in it, so that, there's a, that, that it's, and I, and I think you, you've got a very good point, because you can use the label of research everywhere, but not all research is equal. So all of them is equal if it's done by uh, an ethics standard, and you are doing research that is doing as, as the, the best you can do it, taking into account everything. But uh, indeed, that's a very important point because otherwise you're shooting your foot. You're doing um, your uh, research, but then this is diminishing the value of other research if it's not done properly. So, yes, I agree with you that this is uh, a relevant issue. Yeah. So, Loren, do you wish to say something or move? Sure. I mean, just briefly and building on both those contributions, I think it's also really important that we make sure that um, as we codify our research ethics approaches, that we don't, be, because of, you know, say the, the GDPR, the, the general data protection uh, regulations, uh, I, I've seen researchers say, oh, it's very difficult to do things like collect personal data from groups or engage with groups who are more vulnerable. The risk in saying that is that we then leave those already vulnerable groups out of research. So we need to make sure that as we work towards protecting people and putting processes in place, that we don't actually double down and end up with contexts where already marginalised groups who should be either you know, co-constructing our research agendas, be actively partnering in, in research with us, are not considered because getting through research ethics processes is too difficult in the first instance. So those balances between, you know, how do, you know, again, how do we make it easier to do research with groups um, who are often excluded from research agendas? So, you know, you think about the fact that no test crash dummies have ever been made for pregnant women. So, 
you know, or PPE equipment doesn't fit women because it's modeled for men, or there is a lack of knowledge about how certain skin conditions transpire in the black and Asian community, because all of the subjects in that kind of research are white men normally, you know, and on and on it goes. So, so we need to make sure that the, 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 the ethics of considering your target populations doesn't necessarily have to clash with the effort involved in getting through research ethics proposals. We need to find a way to make sure that it's possible and encourage that those marginalized communities or, or you know, they shouldn't be marginalized communities, but that they're at risk of marginalization, that, that we, we just make sure that it is possible to, to do work with those communities um, in, in the way that we approach our research infrastructure. Yes, um, I think that can be addressed if when we are training our researchers, uh, this is, is, is trained on them. So you can train them how to write and, and how to perform um, projects that are compliant with uh, protecting the rights of the people that you are actually uh, evaluating or obtaining data or analyzing. So I think this could be done. It's just that indeed, if if you are already in your own ways and then you have to come back and learn how to do it, then it's difficult. But if this is ingrained in our training in the universities, in the academy, it's ingrained in our students, then it, it will come quite naturally. And then it will not be such a difficult point because you already know in advance how you should address, how you should protect and how you should share uh, data by protecting the people that you are uh, also analyzing or studying or co-analyzing or co-studying. I think this this could be done if we are already aware beforehand because you know this is as, as always it's very difficult to learn a language when you are 60 years old but if you are learning a language when you are eight years old it could quite naturally that's the way to do it, I think. That's the way to change uh, attitudes, uh, I would say. Okay. Now, while well, we are approaching time, but maybe we have a very first, um, because there were uh, one of the issues uh, that both Teal and, and Lorraine and also uh, Euphoring were, were just passing by, which is uh, multiculturality and, well, in multi language, but also. It, I would say in general, uh, Europe, even if we, it's, it's small, let's say, in numbers, if we compare to other continents, um, there are still a lot of different communities, lots of different type of cultures. Uh, how can we make a better future in Europe uh, that can uh, address in a way to make it easy and fluent how we can even take advantage of these uh, different views so that uh, we get enriched by this uh, multiculturality. So I think this probably will be the last uh, issue. If you, any of you start, uh, I don't know if Till or Lorraine or, or Mireille, whatever, just uh, start by saying what you think about that. Maybe I can start. I think uh, from a, a community engaged research and innovation uh, perspective, I think, um, yeah, if we perform community engaged research innovation, it's important that, um, yeah, both academic and non academic actors that they represent the community, represent the society. So also represent not only this the uh, male, female, but also differences in cultures uh, and other uh, differences. So that that. Uh, yeah, all actors that are involved in community engaged research and innovation should be a good uh, representation of uh, of society. That's uh, uh, yeah, that's I think a point uh, to take into account. Thank you. Any other comment, Till? Yeah, well, just from the focus of artistic practice in that in that case, um, I think it's very important to enable people to decipher. Uh, languages or visual cultures they do not understand usually. So we don't have any training in understanding uh, the the sim 
colonizations of Pakistani miniature painting if we don't focus on that. Uh, but in, in the Fine Arts Academy, you don't learn it. But if you want to get into exchange, you have to understand the background. So there's really, really, I think, a change needed towards um, new description of what we understand as relevant ways of doing research or art or express yourself and to to open the uh yeah the borderlines in our brains <laughs> mostly in, at least in the art field i can say this is happening but it has to be ident uh, intensified because otherwise uh, it will not be possible to include people in our societies as well. So it, it comes to a very practical uh, way how to deal with um, minorities, with migrants, etc. So, yeah. Thank you. I think this is a very good point. Because indeed, Europe is not just only people that have been born here and um, genetically are from Europe. But now Europe has uh, lots of shades and colors and cultures, uh, migrants are also enriching us. So we must uh, have them in mind too. Um, and Rain, maybe? Sure, I'm, I'm going to come at this from my own subject specialist perspective, if I may. Um, I work with deaf people who are sign language users. That is my, my own area. So building on what you said, Till, about understanding uh, the visual parameters of, of particular kinds of artwork, we must also remember in our dissemination, in our research planning and practices, that not all languages are written, and that if you look to the world today to see how much of our intellectual um, dissemination is available in a sign language, very, very little of it is. So there are millions and millions of people in the world who are deaf sign language users. So we should be thinking about inclusivity, not just in terms of dominant languages and minority languages, but also the sign languages of the world as minority languages too. So if we're talking about true inclusion and true multilingualism, we're also thinking about multimodality in that multilingualism as well. Yes, I think uh, this is a very good point because we are talking also about uh, people that have a different normality, let's say. And I'm, I'm working on rare diseases. There are uh, between 6 to 8% of all Europe population has any one of a rare disease. And that means that we have to be inclusive in many other fields, not just only but being there for blind, which more or less all of us know. But uh, I think that if we want to think about university has to be inclusive, that means that we have also to be aware that not everyone has that same type of abilities uh, or capacities, and we have to be open to all kinds of conditions. And, and it, that, that probably should be our goal into the future, a very inclusive Europe of cultures and conditions. Uh, well, I think with that, maybe we can close because it's nearly it's a bit fast from um, three o'clock, which was the right time. I don't know if any of you wishes to say anything to close. I'm going to give you the word. Well, thank you very much. I think it's been very enriching. I think that uh, we have come out with some of the issues that are going to shape uh, this Europe of the future with different views, different ways to look at it. And I'm sure that uh, uh, at least for me, I'm talking about me, I'm going uh, to bed with uh, food for thought, which I think that, that that's actually the point in having this kind of, of round table. Thank you for participating. And I hope that uh, at least with, with, your, uh, with Loren, we are going to meet again, but with any of you in any other meeting or round table, I think it's been very, very enriching. Thank you for being in this kind of university alliances, uh, rethinking uh, the future of the European University. And I think we can just uh, stop here because there is a break and it's starting again, I think, at half past three. Isn't it right, Nicole? I think it's half past three. Yes, that's correct. We start again at the same link of the plenary sessions at 3.30. Okay, then. Thank you all for being here.